Yeah. Well, because everybody <laughs> has to <laughs> that smart of you. most people have to leave early. <laughs> I almost wrote I think we're going to lose half our permission uh, at 5 o'clock yeah. or earlier. I'll go if we can start. We have, do we have quorum? Yeah, we do have quorum. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go if we just jump right in. Aiden went his way in. Who is that? Aiden. 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 Okay, great. Yeah, and David's going to be over uh, shortly. So, uh, but we can um, uh, at least, uh, so does anybody want to volunteer to be the scribe for the, the evening? Where's Christina? No, I uh, know. It, so it's on the agenda again, and I'm still not going to come on her officially. That she is now, I know. as of Thursday. But, but she's not here. She's not here. <laughs> we'll send her a thank you, though. Great. There you go. Thank you. Uh, so, okay. we've uh, already uh, started. Actually, I should announce that this is a recorded, um, <coughs> recorded meeting. And we're looking if someone could uh, volunteer to be a scribe. I'll do it. All right, Aiden. Thank you. Thank God Aiden showed up. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, well, I'd, 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 I'd look to see if we have any further comment, but you guys are on the agenda, so that's not public comment. Really. Um, the next on the agenda is to welcome Christina Hodge as an official member of the Energy Commission, and she's not here. <laughs> so, there we go. The first official act as a member was to not show up. Was to be absent. Great. I don't know how many times I've had that on the agenda. Just <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just take it off. Send an appointment. Um, <laughs> so I would uh, uh, take a, a motion to approve the minutes from so March 12th minutes. Second. Okay. And any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nothing? Okay, looks like that's unanimous. Great. No um, abstentions for not being here. What's that? No abstentions. For you, don't, you don't have to abstain, I understand. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you can still you can still vote whether you're here or not. Because you're ready. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Next up, we have uh, going green. Um, and actually, I think it's more than just going green because we have um, uh, John Stafford. John Stafford from both Gazette and the Recorder and multiple other papers um, here as well. And then Risa. Um, uh, I know you for so long, so Risa Sadolsky. I never pronounce your last name, so here you go. <laughs> With the Going Green publication. And you're going to fill us in a bit on Going Green. Okay. It's all yours. Can we, can we come up to the podium? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for any of you that have tablets or computers, if you want to go to goinggreen.com. Okay, great. I know how much you would have for. That is um, one of the things we're going to be talking about is we're launching a new website for Going Green magazines. Most of our niche publications like Going Green Valley Kids have only had e editions, um, and the next edition will actually be launching this website. Um, it's a fully responsive design, so whether you're using a laptop like me and you have the full version, or you're using a phone or a tablet, it will adjust to fit the screen that's um, it's given. Um, we're looking for sponsors to go on to the um, website uh, for the first three months to um, get it going. Uh, what we're planning to do is, um, it's this, we publish Going Green every three months. Um, with the new website, we're going to be able to pull all the green articles that run in the Gazette, the Recorder, and the Valley Advocate as well. So we'll be offering fresh content on a daily or a weekly basis, because um, we have the software now that, depending on how they slug the article, which is if they put it as a green article. So if Richie Davis is writing about a green initiative or um, Kinder Morgan or any of the other things that are going on up in the Greenfield area, that will automatically pull onto the website. Um, if the Valley Advocate happens to write something um, that's slugged as a green article, then that will automatically pull onto our website. The nice thing about this is any of you that use the Gazette website know that you need a password to get in. 
because um, it is a paid site because we're a daily newspaper. Um, Going Green isn't a paid site, so people will be able to have access to the articles. We can link to the articles, so if the Gazette does an article about um, you know, your commission or what you're offering um, through your commission for the electricity rates um, to folks, then that would get pulled on to the Going Green. So, so that's normally behind their paywall, right. it will be, be on the right of the side paywall. of the paywall for social media stuff. Yes, on the, yes, that, that is correct. So and, I, and I'm sorry, what was the website again? Because it took me that long to get on. Sure, it's going green. Yeah. Dot C O N M O N dot com. And this is the beta, so it'll actually have a different URL that's just, you know, the WordPress um, URL that we're using right now, just so that um, we have a working version that we can look at. Now, in addition, um, we're in the process of updating all our calendar software at the Gazette Reporter and all our other newspapers. And again, because anything that is tagged as a green or energy or anything that would be of interest will go into the calendar um, that will be launched on this site as well. So, um, And then we're hoping to meet with GCC and some of the other folks if you have a blog. Um, we will have blog space as well, so if, you're, if you folks have a blog on the website, we can pull that into the new site, too. Um, so we're trying to really have you know, a more interactive um, site, and we're hoping people will um, volunteer to be bloggers on the site and talk about the different issues you know, that are affecting the green community and um, energy uh, in general. And Risa can speak better about the magazine. I've been more involved in trying to get um, you know, the website up and running. Um, well, I was just hoping that um, by supporting with an ad in the magazine, you help us be able to launch this website and be able to have a green presence in this area, which couldn't happen without the advertising support in the magazine or in the, on the website as a choice. So the magazine's been out for six years now, and it's um, very useful for people who um, want to tell people about their different products and services that they're offering, and also is a place to put information that about the pipeline or whatever, but it, it is limited, and that's why I'm very, very excited about um, the website so that we could expand and get much more information out there. So, if it's been out for six years, have you ever done any surveys, uh, public response to the to the publication, what people think about it, anything like that? Well, the only, you know, we haven't done a survey. I just know that the, my advertisers are continue to advertise with me, so that's a good sign that they're getting the response that they want. Mm -hmm. And also, um, people do tell me that I like the magazine that I run into. And also, people that we already affiliate with, like uh, Nancy Hazard, she's very involved, and the Greenfield is but the first green community. So the people that are voices for Greenfield are, are able to mm -hmm. put their information in there. Right. So they like that. And we're available for anyone to put the information in. You just have to get in touch with us. Lisa, how many copies do you have? 18,000 copies per quarter. And it goes pretty much full distribution from you know, the Long Connecticut River border to the Pioneer Valley. As far as Brattleboro? As far as Brattleboro and to um, and Hampton County. But only a small distribution product. Uh, the nice thing about the website is obviously those questions you ask, it's easy to measure a website. Um, it's harder to uh, measure something that doesn't have an ABC circulation like the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and where we can tell you exactly how many papers are distributed, how many returns are. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier on the daily, but on uh, periodicals like this, you don't typically do those kind of measures. So. But we do have 18,000 copies, and because it's, we do distribute like every week to certain key locations, we get them out by the end of the quarter. There aren't very many left. And it's just sort of like the advocate. So Is this the new member we just applauded? 
No. no. <laughs> How are you? Good. You, uh, you said that the website will include articles from the Gazette and the Recorder? Yes. And the Valley Advocate if they cover anything. Because those are the three papers in our group that we can easily pull from. Um, but with you know the Kendra Morgan issues, we also own the paper up in the Manadnock area. And the Recorder's looking at doing a piece with them because They've just announced that it's going up through that area, so they're a little bit behind on reporting on it. So they're actually pulling some of the recorder articles that Richie Davis had on Kendra Morgan. Because, you know, Peterborough and some of those towns are just found out that um, they've zigged and zagged um, up in the area. So. Did I just hear that you guys also own the Keen Sentinel? No, we don't no. own the Keen Sentinel. We do actually do some printing for the Keen Sentinel. We print a number of papers that we don't actually have. Um, so, no, we have the Peterborough paper, the Concord paper, and then the Valley News up in uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, okay. one of our sister papers. So. It's a really small chain. I think the publisher lives in Northampton. The president of the company lives in Amherst. Um, the, one of the principal owners is his wife who lives in Amherst as well. So we're actually all locally owned. In, so. in the interest of full disclosure, it's my family. Oh. Oh, oh newspapers in New England. Uh, oh. Just as I said, so uh, Aaron Julian lives in, in Amherst. He's the he's the publisher, president, uh, president yeah. of the of the company. I'm sorry, former publisher of the of the Gazette. Okay. And then, so and you're right, Recorder Gazette, the Lebanon paper, and the Concord Daily Monitor. Okay. Yeah, it's, I'm the, on the family tree branch that got sawed off some time ago. <laughs> so, so I don't have any influence beyond the fact that I, I just know the principles. <laughs> and the Dwight's who used to own the oil paper um, that's, are that's still on the board. So. My name's Bill Dwight. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I talked to you on the phone <laughs> late one night. Did you? <laughs> it was. I, I, I ran a date, Dwight. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think we had a date, uh, date wrong on, uh, or needed to get a legal in pretty quickly to get the, um, for a public meeting. Oh, okay. They, they, okay. they called like okay. a, after deadline. And that's oh, that's you, right. You yeah. called Larry. And that Larry was I called Larry. <laughs> a bit of a panic because that's right. That was we needed a public hearing posted. Yes. Yeah. So that um, it is, and in fact, actually, uh, as as paper distribution goes, it's actually it's all in our wheelhouse. Yeah. Right. So is it? Uh, um, I mean, I'm I'm hearing both a a, a, a presentation. On an expansion of what's going on, and, and uh, a request for possibly taking out ad space. Mm -hmm. um, does the commission want to address that now, or bring it back up at a later time, or, or what, what's the feeling? Just for the sake of time to keep moving. Um, in, 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 in pursuing my disclosure, I'd have to recuse myself from any discussion on that. But um, anything that might possibly benefit any family member who's either talking to me or not talking to me they still might, doesn't they matter. They might, they might move the branch back on. <laughs> they, 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 well, they, they could put handcuffs on that branch, so <laughs> stretching the metaphor to absurdity. But yeah, I, I think it's important that I recuse myself from any further discussion on the on on the issue. But yeah. So. What would we be discussing, Chris, in terms of ad specifically? I'm not sure what we would take out for ads. For ad I mean, are you thinking that we would discuss whether we, as a group, would take ads out or not? You know, it's it's it's, 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 it's the commission. I mean, the commission at one point um, uh, contracted to have a whole publication put out around Northampton and what we've done, and printed a whole number of uh, issues. So, so there's some precedent for the. Commission using the revolving uh, sustainability revolving fund uh, to do outreach to the community on certain topics. I don't know if this is you know a viable um, one whether it's uh, writing articles that make sense or or taking out ads. I'm putting it in front of the commission. I mean it's really not up to me. It's so not up to me to say. I, I could imagine a discussion if and when we had something that we might like if we put together the the whole thing we've been talking about about reaching out in terms of energy efficiency in the homes. Then we have an ad, you know, we said, well, one thing we might want to do is mm -hmm. take out an ad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite sure. I would like to know specifically right now what anybody else might think that we would advertise um, at this moment. I mean, we could just advertise ourselves as a great group of well, people. Yeah. I, I'd like to say that, so I work for Nessie, and Nessie has actually written articles and, and in the past done a couple of ads for 
for um, the Green Village Open House because that was a real grassroots yep. sort of community type program. And we haven't done an ad in a little while, but we're still thinking about it. And it seems like a really good publication for reaching the community. So we don't have that need in the same way as we used to, but the combination of an article and an ad, once we get to a point in the community energy efficiency outreach thing, maybe to sort of start grassroots interest and try to get people to tell us really what they want for energy efficiency and that kind of thing. Um, that could be a good yeah, combination I can, I can use and reaching a lot of people because it, it certainly it is, you know, everybody's seen this, right, everywhere. So, I mean, I've seen a lot of places. So I think it's worth um, sort of rolling into that community energy efficiency outreach plan. I think to run an ad, we we need either an event or something yeah. to yeah. Uh, advertise. <laughs> oh, Maybe yes. the, uh, the outreach when, when we're ready for that would be a good opportunity. I'd love to see us just have a link on your website, though, to the to the MESC site on the, on the city website. Right? There's no, no harm in doing that. Nope. Nope. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's kind of up to them whether they want to put the link in. <laughs> <laughs> but also, yeah. what, if you want to get community interaction, that might be a great thing to do. Website. Yeah, I think we really talked about in the past uh, blogging, like taking turns once a month, someone writes something that was for a newspaper, like editorial or something. Um, or I don't know if our new website has a potential to have a blog or column in it. But that's something if we did, we could get out in various channels, including this. It kind of makes that idea right. more uh, interesting. And there's more value that you get later each folks. Yeah. But of course, for us, the reason we're here is we need support to the website so that we can get it launched. And you know, because that's one of the things that Aaron tells me is that um, okay, you can have a website, but you got to have support for it. You have to have advertising support. If it's going to serve a community need, then you know we have to have folks that will be willing to um, you know advertise on it. So are you advertising on the site as well as in the printed version? Yeah, there's um, if you look if um, this piece of paper. Oh, for that shows different prices mm -hmm. for putting your link to your basically that is exactly what that is. Yeah, so probably when you know, at your next <coughs> so there's a leaderboard. Probably your next quarter check by Emily because maybe we'll have a message to get out specific around the, you know mm -hmm. a specific uh, uh, initiative that we're doing that we're working on now. Okay. We're not ready yet. Okay. And also, Chris, if, if because um, the the website isn't really quarterly, it's mm -hmm. ongoing. So when you are ready, okay. Just let me know. Yeah. So if it doesn't meet up with the publication, you can always, you know, nice thing about um, websites within two minutes. If we have an ad, we can launch it um, through the analytics and get it up immediately. So if it, your event doesn't exactly fall when um, going green is going to be doesn't mean that we can't get it out to our going green uh, readers. So. And okay. We'll be promoting this the website heavily in going green so that people, you know, come and look for new articles because that's the problem with you know three month publication is that you know towards the third month um, it's getting a little stale. So um, with the website we can update as we go. And if you do launch a blog, that's something easy that we can uh, even if it doesn't exist anywhere other than on your personal, you know, site, then we can go grab that information and run it into our blog. So you don't have to be advertiser to blog? No, because no, we, we want information. Content, sure. You know, as long as it's good information. Um, you know, even the Gazette, you know, um, I think Max Hartshorn and a few other people still have a blog somewhere um, on one of our back pages. That, that's part of the, um, you don't have to go through the paywall to get to the blogs on the Gazette site. Cool. So, apart from the blog concept, uh, we're looking at articles. Uh, what would be the minimums or the maximums as far as words? Give us an idea of what you might be looking at as far as filling space. Um, usually, 500 words is, 500. is the limit. Uh, but if you wanted to write, what we would do is get in touch with Chris Harris, who's our editor. Um, and, you know, she reserves the right to edit anything. So, um, but we are, we're always, you know, if it's, it's good content that is well written, then 
You want to save this? Pictures? Yeah. Um, oh, those with them? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. And also, you can um, you can send it to me when I contact the people that I speak with. And it's also in the video. Um, I can send it to her to put in the um, hard copy, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, to see if she does something she'd be interested in. She's mm -hmm. looking for any of your events, if you send them, once we have the new um, calendar system up at the Gazette Recorder and Valley Advocate, if you put your green events, uh, fill out the form that's going to be available. It's going to be a standard form so it automatically can launch into any of the calendars, um, then that would appear on, on Going Green too, because we're going to pull that from the other side. So we'll probably have our own, but you know, it's kind of one-stop shopping. Um, our, Calendar software is going to be able to, you know, if it's a Greenfield event, it'll probably show up on the Monadnock Ledger's um, website, too, if it, it makes sense. And if they put a Keen event in, because a lot of people from Greenfield go to Keen shopping, then it would show on the recorder site. So it's pretty exciting that um, we're going to have that software that's kind of going to do it for us instead of having an editor trying to fix everything all the time to get it to show up. So. Any other questions? This isn't a question for today, but I think it's a great idea to write articles and blog for these kinds of publications. I, for one, wouldn't feel comfortable doing it unless I knew the rules of engagement around a commission member doing such a thing. Like, what are we not allowed to say, are allowed to say? You, you're, a, you're a citizen of the United States, and as such, you're allowed to express yourself freely in any regard. If we don't represent I, ourselves as a commission You member. can't actively campaign for office or for someone else in office in the as as a member of this board, but you can as a, everything else you're allowed to do as a citizen you're allowed to do. And so we don't have to be careful not to identify ourselves as a commission member. Um no. Uh, no. I mean you know if you felt squeamy about something like that, it, it would it would be appropriate to if you felt that you were trying to sneak something by or someone who may misinterpret that, there's no harm in identifying yourself as a member of the Northampton Management Commission. There's nothing Nothing that precludes you uh, ethics law under ethics law for that because okay. you're a deliberative recommending body, but you're not uh, you're not an elected member or anything like that. And it certainly doesn't touch on open meeting law because you can't get more open. Right, right, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Although, believe me, the open meeting law becomes more and more arcane. But but uh, you know the. Always be mindful of potential conflict of interest. I mean, if you're promoting a product for yourself as as and then as an authority, and then using your um, status as a member here, that would definitely that would definitely qualify. I was more thinking of like taking a political stance on something. That's perfectly legit. Okay. okay. Can we dismiss all you? Um, well, I, I mean, to wrap it up, what I'm hearing is that. Uh, the commission certainly is open to thinking of ideas for blogs, articles, uh, ads, when they make sense. And, um, you know, Risa, if you want to just kind of continue to kind of shoot me an email saying the next issue is coming out, just so I can kind of remind people uh, if it's timely, so we don't miss a, a deadline. And, uh, um, and one more that. thing is we are, we are working actively towards an outreach program. And I think at the point when the outreach program was was functioning that, that this would be an ideal venue to to um, get the word out so it would change I think our our uh, I think we might be a lot more willing to um, spend some money on our on on promoting our outreach program than than simply promoting ourselves okay thank you You're welcome thank you for being here thank you for stopping by Chris I have to think that we may want to just have a standing reminder on our agenda. Is there anything we've talked about today that belongs as a, even a simple announcement, you know, belongs in an outreach? I, I just tend to think we, we sort of forget that element of oh, what yeah. we do. Oh, yeah. So, it's so easy. The whole publicity piece yeah. is so right, easy. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's as simple as, I mean, a lot of the bigger things like the LED street lighting make its way into the Gazette without us doing anything. Or maybe you did just some. Uh, no, the littler things, I, I think they just kind of, we go okay. about our business and we forget that there's a world out there. Okay, yeah, I can, I'll put, I'll put a note down there. I can put that on the end of every agenda. 
and uh, we'll see it. We'll think about it and until it pops up. Okay, sure. Okay. I'm assuming the rest of the commission is fine with that. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. The next item, Bay State Village Association, uh, put on on the agenda because it's coming up real soon. I know the commission showed some interest when uh, it, there was a presentation on it, and I wanted to give anybody an opportunity, as reminders, last minute organization. I don't have anything to do with this agenda. I just wanted to uh, leave a space available if anybody has that. So I know I didn't. We warn anybody to come prepared, but I, I think it sounds neat, but I'm not going to be in town. Okay, so and I know you were kind of taking point on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I haven't heard from the organizer. Oh, you haven't? No, send a note. No email or anything. So it's already well, April, I think, it, right? The person who was here just had a baby, so oh, that was good. That yeah, but I mean, I have her because I'm going to represent the carbon 350 mm -hmm. uh, or mass whatever that what I talked about last time and the only thing that I noticed from the latest emails when he was here he talked about it being an all-day event but it's going to be an afternoon event okay is there, is there a mass biker school is he sending out a mass email to people who are tabling or is there some channel to get more information about logistics or time or he handed me a card in um so that's but if you see me after the meeting, I can forward you something, and then you will have. Sure. I have his info, so I'll reach out to him. Okay, okay. I was gonna say. Okay, yeah. I was gonna suggest that I just connect you to. Him. Yeah, I have his card still. Okay. So. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's not like a good event. I didn't want to permission to miss an opportunity to do outreach. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. So. The um, review of the filed state legislation. I, I put this on, and I think I'm going to keep this as a, uh, unless the commission really doesn't want it, um, as, a, a, as an ongoing agenda item for a while. There's just an enormous number of bills that have to do with renewables, energy efficiency, something, um, and I'm going to kind of keep going through them. And uh, I, I decided that perhaps the best, because there's so many of them, perhaps what I'll do is I try to lump them together by topic and bring them up to the commission by topic, just in case. Um, so um, I, I do have one topic to go over today. I will pass this around. And um, I'll um, preface it with um, to let everybody know that we, uh, we have an RFP out for uh, developing a PV array on the landfill. Uh, we have our pre um, uh, pre proposals uh, uh, mandatory meeting uh, yesterday uh, in City Hall. We had 21 people show up, 21 different organizations represented. Um, don't know if they're all going to pro provide proposals, but it was a very good showing. Um, uh, our owner's agent, Beth Greenblatt, is doing a great job. She just she ran that, that meeting beautifully. Um, I mean, really professionally. They just, I just can almost feel the proposals, the you know, the, the possible proposals that are kind of swarming. Uh, you, you must provide this and this and this and this and this. And this. <laughs> you know, so uh, she did a great job. Um, but there is one thing we're facing is the fact that uh, uh, we need to have net metering to make this work. And at the moment, um, National Grid's territory has reached its cap, um, and there are now. Uh, about almost 20 uh, megawatts of um, proposal, or 20 megawatts of uh, systems that are on the waiting list for the cap. Um, where the that the be, cap, does that mean they can't take any more, or they don't have to take any more? Legislatively, they've got a cap on the amount that the um, national grid, the different utilities can take. Um, uh, and in the past, this has been up a couple times, last year, end of the last legislative session, um, there was kind of a marathon session where they didn't make a really comprehensive change they wanted to, so they just raised the cap um, around across the board. But the National Grid has reached it again. So I just want to be clear, the question was, that's a cap they can do, or they that's the cap and they cannot go any higher? Is that what they well, mandatory need to do? You know, I'm not positive about that. Because that's a big difference whether they choose heard of anything. No, it, it, it's a cap that they are choosing to put in place. They can right. certainly so they chose to allow more the legislator, solar in the grid. The would. legislators are putting that. Right. Way. Okay. Yes. So the so national right. grid could go over that cap if they wanted to. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. Could you, could I mean, you they could go to 
net zero if they wanted, but obviously that isn't in their business interest, so uh, they work in collaboration with the legislators to set a particular cap that balances their business interests right. with okay. the public interest. So could you explain to me again, uh, us, why, unless we go to net metering, Sure. Why, why uh, is that cost effective? Yeah. Um, right now, we're looking at putting a very large array on a landfill that has a tiny little G1 account that'll use, you know, maybe a quarter of a percent of what that right. array develops. Um, without net metering, you can't use it anyplace else. You could not effectively assign that um, uh, use to any other account. So we could have it built. The Constructed, the folks who's constructed to get all the SREX, which is what probably what they will do. But the only way the city's really going to get money for it is if we get reduced costs on that meter. So our electric bills are dropped. That's really the effective way. So, so, so the, city, the, the city's electric, the city's electric bill that they pay is not part of that. If the city could use that directly, fine. But we can't. Right. Right. What it is is a net metering credit is basically it says. Um, uh, if, if you own the system behind the meter, uh, like from, from my house, in the summertime, I might actually produce more than I use. So I get a monetary credit for that amount. I can't do anything with that except for buy more electricity. Right. Um, so in the wintertime, when I'm not producing as much, I use those credits to buy electricity. So the landfill would produce a huge amount of credits that the city would own, or we, you know, through our contract with the, the installer we would own. Um, and what we're going to do with them is we're going to use them, use them uh, to buy electricity uh, for other accounts. And we would buy them from the third party at a reduced price, at a lower price than we, than we buy um, uh, uh, supply from. So effectively, we get a coupon, uh, a discounted coupon, to buy a full kilowatt hour with. Um, and that's the way it works. So, so it's important to have the net metering. Um, and we hit and now the, you've confused me. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, if you could do it that way, you're basically wheeling power from one city facility to another yes. and using the utility as the wires. Yes. That doesn't require net metering. Yeah. Um, net does, metering is where you get full retail rate for every kilowatt hour you produce. I may be wrong here. But that yeah, this not. I think only on the site. That's the thing about the net metering. If you put the 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 array on the landfill, mm -hmm. nobody's using any of the electricity at the landfill, that's, right. that's all. And in order for National Grid to be required to give you anything for that power that you've created and move it is if it's under this net meter. It is, it's a little bit different uh, than, we, than wheeling electricity over, because that's actually moving kilowatt hours. Right. This isn't moving kilowatt hours. What you're doing is you're getting a monetary credit. It's no longer kilowatt hours. You're getting a monetary credit. Right. And you get to use that monetary credit to pay a bill. But it's not one for one. It's not one it, for one. It's not one for one. But it has to be used by another account owned by the same owner. No, the, mm -hmm. the third party that would own, put the PV array in and maintain it, um, they would own the net metering credits. Okay. But our contract, you know, it's not worth us for us to put the PV array out there unless we get something for it. Sure. And our contract will be based on um, uh, you sell us those net metering credits at a reduced price. I see. So it's worth it because now we get some significant savings, monetary savings out of that. Oh, so the contractor is the one that we're paying, it's not the yeah, utilities. It through that. Right, exactly. And you need net metering to make that transaction. Yes, work. right, right. And you have to get in underneath the cap. Um, so um, so because of that, is knowing... Is that cap annual? Like, do they do it's no, it's not. There's not an annual to it. It's um, the legislation sets the cap, and if they can do it whenever they want to, or they can ignore it. Um, National grid territory is the only place where the cap's been reached, uh, and it has been reached. Um, and so there's you know, a strong desire for have that cap lifted. Um, and start getting close to reaching their cap as well. Um, so um, can you sell it to Eversource? Uh, <laughs> right. Um, so the um, and you know just to, to get to the legislation. So what I did was I said, is there any legislation out there for net metering that has to do with net metering? And there is. Um, and so I thought I would bring up uh, what legislation there is, 
And I don't know if we decide to do anything right now. It may be that this is just informative and we want to kind of find out a little bit more detail about any of these bills. But I'll go over what I've got so far. So um, item number one, the item numbers on the side are just for us to reference, um, is House Bill 2852. And this one, um, as far as net metering goes, it would lift uh, the cap to 60, um, 1,600 megawatts. Right now, the effective cap <coughs> adds up to about 1,000 megawatts. So it would raise it about uh, 600 megawatts more. And if you look at how they allocated the cap, if they keep that same way of allocating, that would effectively mean that National Grid would get about another 150 megawatts allocated. And there's 20 already on the waiting list. So that would be a significant amount it would allow us to keep going, you know, if this bill plays out the way that I'm, I'm reading it. Um, so that's what, that's a bill that we like very well, you know, whether we say right to that bill, the commission might want to think about doing some political um, um, advocacy um, for this, whether bring it up to city council and ask them, um, reach out to our representatives and senators and say, you know, can you make sure this bill makes it through? Or we might want to just do it in a, in a broader way, saying, you know, we need a bill that does this for us. Um, it's really important. Yeah. Who are the active opponents of this? Are, I, don't, I don't know. Are the, um, are the utilities actively against this? No, I, you know, I don't know for sure. I don't, I don't think so, but they might be starting to get a little... Right. Uh, um, let me get to the next two, and you'll, you might see... <laughs> yeah. Do you know where this is in the hopper? Is it in committee? Is it, is it, uh... as, far, as far as I know, the, what the legislation, what they've gotten to at the moment is um, they're basically just assigned the bill number to them. Got it. It's really early on. Got it. So this, um, this is not something we're going to see before the year's out, that's for sure. Uh, it very well could be. My yeah. next, really what I'm hearing is that there's kind of a hope and almost a belief that net metering will be addressed quickly. Um, well, that's hopeful. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's hopeful. And I, I mean, I, I can't tell you any reason why I say that, except for that's kind of what I hear. And it's the reason why we're going forward with this PV um, RFP and proposals, is because we want to get on that waiting list as early as possible. Um, uh, and if the net metering cap doesn't get raised, we will be delayed until it does. But th there is hope that we will we'll have it, possibly, you know, uh, Next couple of weeks, I don't know. That that's, that seems like almost possible, but that's yeah. right. That's not going to happen. Right? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, uh, but so that's one that we might very well want to uh, address. The next two down, one is like uh, number two and number three. I'm not a legislator, so I'm giving you my interpretation of what I've seen in the bill's language. And as far as I can tell, what the bills would do would be a net, limit any net metering in case of number two, to 150% of the on-site load, which would effectively kill net metering. And number three, it basically would, um, the way I read it, was eliminate net metering except for the on-site load. You can't, can't go over your on-site load uh, based on a three-year average of your energy use. And so that would kill net metering. So obviously there's a couple of bills out there that are aimed to really squash net metering altogether. Um, I don't know if the commission, you know, I would say before we go in opposition of these, we would need to talk to someone and say, are we reading this right? But would the commission be interested in actively opposing this kind of a bill? Um, and those are the they most seem important to be usually ones. Usually exclusive, but I don't, I don't understand. They do the same thing, but in different numbers? That's, that's essentially how we take the lesson. Each. each Representative who wants to write some legislation will write some legislation. That thinks it's with their name on it. This, these are two products of lobbyists, if you might like guess, um, and uh, they throw as much stuff to see what will stick. And then someone else gets to, you know, be successful with the bill. But yeah, that's 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 why actually why Chris has found so many actually bills with right. the same Chris, so right. just to just want to be I'm a little confused. So. Are things now like um, community solar, which you know, big, big right. solar arrays that are going up, if those were to try and happen now, what you're saying in our area, that they wouldn't be able to go, they just have to be on this waiting list as well? That could be. I mean, there are some exceptions. 
Um, there's, and there's also a public cap and a private cap. Um, uh, we're really concerned with the public cap right now. National Grid's met both the part, but their public cap and their private cap. So it would sound like the answer would be yes. I think you're right. as a, as a, I think so, unless there's some exception for community solar. In other words, just so um, clear, the, so right now in this area, the only solar that could go up for a short time or go on the waiting list is solar that's just like you and I have on our home or on a building. Yes. That large arrays cannot even be built in our area right now. Right. And well, they might that, be, there, there might be some that could still be built because they might already have allocated cap. They right. may have gotten the allocation. Right, but if they right. haven't done that, right. any, they haven't new, done projects, that. Right. any new project would not be allowed unless they're already right. in the pipeline. Right, right. The pipeline, it wasn't the pipeline going to be built, but getting into that and actively moving into the pipeline is probably... Which both speaks to the incredible success of solar in the last yes, few years, but also that it wasn't, it wasn't enough foresight to see that this could happen. Right. Okay. Right. Do you know what the technological challenges are? That justification for the for the caps. Um, I think part of it is, you know, I, I can't. I don't even want to be the one to speak to. Um, uh, I, there's no technical uh, problem. With so it. it's just they don't want to lose their their funds. Right. Yeah. This is purely legislative. Yeah. There's That's nothing technical, technical about it. Right. It's yeah. very simple. The demand issues. Yeah, Louis. Come on. Come on. Yeah. It's all yeah. really Louis. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, my electric property. bill just went up like a bunch. Yo, well, that's that's because there's not enough capacity yet. Right. That's, yeah. So that, that we, can, so we can argue about that too. That's yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> that's not correct. <laughs> <that's not laughs> okay. Um. So here I am. I brought something to you guys and just kind of tossed it out on the table. Something that maybe takes a lot more thinking. But uh, first reactions. Um, uh, does anybody I, have any thoughts on what we're yeah, I think we should go on record in any possible case, particularly with uh, Peter Cocott and with mm -hmm. Stan Rosenberg and any other legislator who would support um, the expansion of net metering for the reasons that we and, and make our case. I think we should we should represent with a letter each time that any of these bills, as these bills make their way through the House, it's they rely on testimony like that. And also speak in opposition of anything that may subvert our ambitions. I mean, they have lobbyists who are paid a lot of money to represent their positions. We are not highly paid lobbyists, and we clearly have a vested interest, and it's, it's only appropriate. And I think it's we're, it's responsible for us to to say quite clearly with uh, every time that we can to say emphatically that we we believe that that metering has benefits not only our community but other communities as well and and that they have an opportunity to expand you know this is also all in the context of the fight over the pipeline and other things and, and increased capacity of natural gas <clears throat> as various fuel systems try to game their way into primacy we on the other hand are arguing for conservation and for um, alternative generation of power, um, so that we don't have to go through this roller coaster and these kind of pissing contests. So I think that I'm all for saying rather emphatically, yay or nay, depending what that bill goes for. I, I also would maybe you could reach out to, to Peter Coca, and I, I'd be curious where the bill is. Ask him what he thinks he needs. You know, right? We get his suggestions about what we might be able to do. Um, it may even be a group. Let's go uh, go to Boston at some point down the road. But you know, I would ask him where it is, and even if we could get through to Stan at this point, find out from him, and and even voice just directly to him our concerns about this. My only question is, we'd be careful to state it such that it's just generically supporting that metering, not necessarily. I'm a little nervous about saying yay or nay on any of these because it's it's like a yes no proposition. I've right. read it three times yeah. to know what yes right. means. That's why I would ask Peter. Yeah, I okay. right. okay. And that, that does what he would know. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I suggest. Just make sure yes. We might want to just give a generic. We need yeah. this. Right. No, I, I yeah. agree. I think I, you can generically proclaim that we believe that net metering as a, as a benefit to the entire community at large, and we everything we strive for is. Um, that metering facilitates that, yeah, and, and the, that, the loss of that metering and anything that that weakens it or diminishes it and doesn't even consider expanding it, we're opposed. Right. 
Especially because we have a near uh, shovel ready project. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's this is really. The, yeah. that new? Right. The, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, I think that, that legislators often will get um, from lobbyists position papers, and there may well be uh, position papers from the solar industry that, are, that we could right. perhaps get from the legislators that give us a better idea of what you know the specifics are. They're not always, you can't always necessarily take them at face value, but it gives you more explanation about what the, the nuts and bolts of the bill are. No, actually, my son works for the Solar Energy Industry Association, which is a trade association oh, yeah. for solar yeah. companies. Yeah. I could get a pretty solid opinion on all of these. Uh -huh. Would you? Yeah. Yeah. Would you send me an electronic for this? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because if there was a particularly uh, positive bill, we could, you know, we could conceivably su support specifically that bill. Um, the uh, or alternately um, oppose specifically oppose a bill that you know really cut the legs out from government. The right. Building Officials Association do that all the time. They actually subscribe to mm -hmm. uh, services for providers and trainers, and they help their members sort of digest it yeah. and mm -hmm. make, make it. Yeah. 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 We're seeing positive. What a good uh, <laughs> 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 it's it's a good time. Great topic for a uh, editorial for an outreach series in theory, right? And in the context of the pipeline and talk about the new generation versus conservation and what the agents can do or not do. Who wants it? Maybe after we have specific information of what we should be supporting right. or fighting, right. then, then it then becomes targeted in the context of what we're ready to do in Northampton and, uh, and the pipeline or whatever, however else, however big we want to make it. Yeah, I mean, part, part of the struggle is because this stuff, these conversations get really lost in the weeds because of the, the complicated language and this, you're trying to make it a public appeal and editorials. I think you have to explain net metering more like frequent flyer miles or something. I think that the, there has to be a way in which to explain it so that someone can understand it. Because it, these are rather convoluted. Um, they're economic systems with different words attached to them. And, the, and, it, and it's to make the case why it's important, why we, why we could put a solar array up on the landfill and all that we get to do is power one light bulb up there. And, and and that's it. We don't. There's. We can't send it anywhere else that it is to our benefit. That's a case to make. And then, yeah. as opposed to getting lost in the sure. in the prosaic language, you say all, all, all the solar fields you see around. You know, this this is what they do. This is right. how they work. Right. Exactly. And the whole solar boom in the U.S. is driven by this. Right. I mean, you know. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think that's the case. It's to make. the money that puts up the privately funded paper rates. Yeah. You know, the one in Williamsburg. Um, Right, it's an investment the second one in Williamsburg proposed kind of died on the line because of this because of this issue. Very well. I, well, I coming to this meeting, I had no idea net metering was had such a risk of being legislatively overruled. I, I, I didn't know we were getting close. close. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that we hit the cap. Right, and and I'm pretty sure National Grid's not going to do it. Be consumed by altruism and something say, Oh, this cap map, let's, let's this thing's rocking, let's let it go. The cap was actually, uh, you know, it was, it was far, it was, that was as high as they were prepared to go. They would have much preferred the cap to go back, I'm sure. So, yeah, could, could very well be. Right? Chris, can I just comment just real quickly? I'm, I'm fine with that, sure. Yes. Uh, just a word of caution on, on these net metering bills. There's there's a number of uh, ALEC bills, I don't, you know, right. folks, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, American yeah. Legislative Executive yep. Committee, whatever they, the Koch brothers call their. Right. Uh, so they, I know they have a couple of net metering bills that are out there that would essentially attach some sort of tariffs to the net metering, which would kind of wash out the benefit of the net metering. I don't, I'm not familiar with these Massachusetts bills, if any of those have this language, ALEC mm -hmm. language, but it might be something to uh, to look at. That, so it almost sounds good, but then there's this tax. That right. It sounds like they're raising the you know cap, or you know they're allowing for net metering, but then they build in this tariff to kind of spread the cost 
to offset the cost of the utilities among all ratepayers. So, so just word of caution. Al Alec are the great people who brought you stand your ground law. In Florida. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're really great folks. The Net Metering Task Force met at the Building Energy Conference. Uh, I, I gave them a big auditorium to meet in, and the, the reports that I got were that um, a couple of people who were representing uh, the smaller solar business owners were not standing up to the other people on the on the committee, and. And the smaller business, the smaller solar businesses are the ones that are going to be hurt most by right. this uh, lack of raising the cap on net metering. And I, I heard a lot of small business owners really complaining that that Seabane and even SIA were not like, you know, supporting that, and they were just caving to utilities and other interests. So I'm I'm so interested to hear what what your son might report from what their motivation is. For not working harder to bust uh, bust the cap. Mary, do you know if residential power purchase agreements are at risk in this at all? That's kind of the I mean, I think business that's model similar. that grew that whole exploded solar on the residential side. Well, last last summer, everybody was all in a furor to get their projects registered in this pipeline underneath, you know, before the net metering cap was hit. And I remember reading stuff saying they're up to X, you know, possible megawatts. Now they're up to this. Now they're up to this. And if you don't get your project in, you won't. And this is what was trying to sell stuff. You know, we're 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 going to be limited. Book your project now. Even so, in, even Solaris Northampton was uh, under that sort of pressure. So. I'm like, really? so yeah, towards that, there is there is another bill that's out there that again, I you know we probably we really need someone to um, uh, so item number four, I read that as ensuring that any on-site produced power for on-site, uh, um, in other words, if you're if you're not producing more power than you use, you will get net metering. Um, so there is a bill that basically says, you know, that's going to be allowed no matter what. There's not going to be a cap on that. So that, that's a, someone basically trying to say. Residential. So residential right. usage is really not is, at is, risk if you're just right. putting a few kilowatts on your roof. Right, right. I, 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 there's a bill that I read that way. Um, I'm, I'm not positive if I'm right. You know, a lot of times the bills, when you read the language, it says, remove this subject and put this subject in. Well, what, what comes before that? I can't see. I don't see the whole yeah. bill. You just see. The pieces are changing, so it's hard to interpret all of them. I thought that the residential class of generation um, had a different set of criteria um, that, that the state was sort of right. the, um, enforcing or these, mandating. These, uh, item number two and item number three, they apply the same language to class one, class two, or class three. Items. So it's as if they're trying to do this to everybody, no matter how big it is. Um, and it, I wouldn't be surprised at all if these were lobbyists driven. Because right? uh, it really does just seem like it, you know, that would kill it. <laughs> um, so, besides this, is this something that if the, if the commission, we get our act together, we know what we're trying to support, that it goes up to city council or anything? Um, yeah, you could, in fact, actually, if you wanted the city council to sign on it as well, then, um, you know, you would forward some recommendations or resolution. And we would do it in the form of a resolution that we would uh, forward on to all our elected representatives, uh, all the way up to the governor. Okay. And there's the other rub: is whatever survives this is a new governor with um, um, with a different attitude relative to this. So, so, so towards that, um, was it the lieutenant governor that was visiting? It was the lieutenant governor. She, yes, she was here. Uh, Yesterday. With the mayor. Right. 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 And, and the mayor's office actually sent me a note saying, can you give me a, give me a bullet point on that meeting, basically? So I, I did write a bullet point on um, this is a high priority city, so this the capital um, So I'm assuming that the mayor brought that up to the lieutenant governor. Yeah, we'll see. The lieutenant governor actually stands 
in several rooms to the right of the governor's, just so. Oh, but in, insofar as that she doesn't have any particular, she has influence, she doesn't have a vote. That right. we, the governor can veto, though, so. so yeah. um, uh, okay, so towards this, is there anything else that wants to be said here? I mean, Aiden is, uh, Scott's volunteered to kind of help get some, some feedback from uh, his son at eBay. That's the, uh, does anybody else want to take any of this on themselves, do a little research or anything? Well, I like the angle of uh, asking Kokot for his position. Okay. I mean, does it, I'm going to open it up for commissioners to step forward and do that if anybody wants to. Well, Paul and I can talk to uh, Peter. We'll we try and talk to Peter. Okay, that, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. See, we'll see where he stands on this. Okay, good. Thanks. All right, um, so we, we're not losing more people here, it's almost five. We lost a couple. Um, um, oh, I guess before we're done with the file state legislation, uh, topic-wise, is there any topic that besides this net metering one that uh, anybody would want me to look at next? And efficiency, promoting renewables in any general way? There's a federal energy efficiency bill moving ahead. I'll look into it. Okay, okay. And I'm looking at the state level right here because we are at the beginning of a two year legislative process. Mm -hmm. And so, what I'm, what I'm thinking is that we can identify things that look boring and hopefully, you know, before they sneak through, have get, you know, start stepping start about it. And anything that looks really promising that we want um, gives enough time, uh, uh, an opportunity to really get on top of it before it goes too far. So, yeah, I would pick energy efficiency in my next, uh, my, myself. Um, anything that's kind of supporting energy efficiency. But, um, yeah, well, I is there anything on the code side? Please? Say what? Anything happening around stretch code or the um, 2015 code? Uh, there's some proposals to eliminate the stretch code. The complexity is apparently making people people are concerned because in a stretch code community, you can build a less efficient house than you can in a non-stretch code, yeah. and it's not fixing itself. So I don't know where that's going to go. Um, and the arguments, the uh, Home Builders Association is arguing ferociously against the proposals for the stretch code. And so the stretch code proposals aren't going anywhere. Uh, you know, with all this doom and gloom about how expensive it's going to be and how it's practical. It's going to be. So that's, that's, a, that's the one piece I do know. So one thing that's related, and this might, might be some legislation around this, or at least some advocacy opportunity, is that the next building code, the 2015 building code, has a performance path option that's similar to the stretch code, very similar. Is, is one of the considerations in green communities requiring that performance path and, you know, in lieu of the stretch code? Um, or is that something that people can well, I think that, that I think that, that they're pretty confused because we're here now. Right. And then the, there's this 2015 adoption of the ninth edition, which would be the adopting the 2015 code, which is out, and, and you know a lot of I mean, a lot of other jurisdictions are using it. They haven't decided how much they're going to amend it. There's a big debate about amending it, and the principle of amending it is going to be only the legislative amendments, or are and, and they they've got they've rewritten the administrative chapter. Because that's where they're putting all the legislative amendments in. But what the rest of it comes out, you know, the 2015 uh, uh, code requires residential sprinklers, and if they're not, and there's no legislation against residential sprinklers, so if they're only going to um, amend it with the legislation, does that mean there's sprinklers? And, and so there's a lot of discussion about things like that. Um, and Massachusetts has a history of like we didn't they skipped uh, I mean they adopted the 2009 code so and they're arguing about whether they skipped the 2012 code they're arguing about adopting the 2015 code the 2018 code is only about like a little ways away so you know it's not it's not nice it's not simple. Um, and just an interesting thing, I, I talked to a couple of the people in Boston, periodically technical people, 
And the most common answer to a question I get is, that's a good question. <laughs> it's like getting a definitive answer is difficult. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, like, and? I mean, never mind in the email, this is just a conversation which they could plausibly deny. So, I'm, you know, I'm like, well, it would be a good thing to be aware of. I mean, it's one of the strengths of being in the community is having this kind of code. So, on this legislative topic, if things, if you see opportunity to weigh in or right. things changing one way or another. Well, one of the things that, one of the, one of the, one of the things that occurred to me was incentivizing energy efficiency on a, on a municipal level with, with zoning. You know, you can't, you can't require on a local level building code concerns, but you can incentivize energy efficiency. And we talked about the infill development and the multifamily development and, you know, increased efficiency. Um, and so, and so, could we could we expand that or broaden that? And I don't know how you would do it. I don't know what you would be zoning. But we give right. We, to we've get always that. favored. We much prefer, particularly when it comes to zoning, carrots versus sticks. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, but then we just adopt the zone. But what? Or Dowdy, you, can you can change it. You can change zoning. It's all. Dowdy will tell you in a few right. minutes. The right. zoning is right. zoning is fluid. It doesn't happen immediately, but it, you can readjust zoning. As, as it presents itself, it becomes problematic. So, but it's another approach. If we could, if we don't get, you know, if if uh, state regulations don't catch up with the idea of a green community, uh, you know, I don't know what carrots you could offer for single-family homes, um, but you might be, you know, certainly you could, you know, figure out ways to incentivize it to the degree you could. Mm -hmm. Anything that requires any kind of a zoning permit has an opportunity to incentivize. So, Louis, do you have any information on where people have done something like this? And you know, samples. No, samples. We have. There's a couple of situations right. where, where um, there's some benefits. You, you can do things under with in zoning. Under the zoning ordinance, if you have an energy a house that meets a certain level of energy efficiency that you couldn't do, if it didn't, you'd have to do something else. You can potentially add a number of units. You can add a little square footage. However, it yeah. works out. Um, yeah, I mean it's, it's an intriguing idea to me. I'd, I'd be interested in. It, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of squishy ground, but you have to be careful how you proceed. And, and on, on something that's allowed by right, it's hard to figure out how you can offer a zoning incentive. But once you get people in front of the um, in front of the zoning or planning boards, and you're allowing them to do something, could you allow them to do something slightly different if? If they were more energy conscious, and you can't mandate can't mandate building code concerns, but you can take something that's like you can't tell them how to get there, but you can say if you get to this point. And I think that the proposal for the project on Hospital Hill that Transformations is coming forward with is the the the, z, the net zero energy is is a selling point to that project. A special permit is is to allow something that's better for the community, uh, as opposed to um, um, something that's you know allowed by the right. So, are are the transformations houses getting this sort of special zoning incentive? Are they are they taking advantage of that? Just that well, I think in a in a in a in a broader sense, in in the, in that the criteria for a special permit is that it's better for the community. And so when you present an application for a special permit, you have to demonstrate that what you're proposing is better for the community than something. Um, there's, there's another standard, which is that it's not substantially more detrimental to the community. And that's a pretty, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> step over that. But something that's better, and so when you present, in order to demonstrate that it's better, you can use energy efficiency as one of the criteria. We're, we're, we're pretty limited, though, by incentives. I mean, we don't have that many incentives that we're actually legally allowed to do. Right? So, yeah. But within the very narrow squishy room that 
Louis talking about, there is an opportunity. We did it with King Street Zone at one point, once upon a time, was we reduce your parking requirements if you built closer up to the street, did two stories, you, you, and your open space requirements, your green space, could be diminished as, a, as compensation and trade-off. Those were all incentives and they were not restrictions, despite the way it's been presented by some people, that they were all limitations and point back that they were incentivizing. But, and then consequently, on large developments, not always so effective. On homeowners, for individual homes, though, it could be something that could work better. Okay, well, I'll take that as a stretch code is an interest. If I look at mass legislation, anything that has to do with stretch code, that's also regulation as well, so it might not be in the legislation. Um, and I'm, you know, interested if anybody can bring more ideas forward on how, you know, if the stretch code goes away, what the campus can do otherwise, just to kind of have that, you know, at least so we're kind of thinking about it in advance. Um, yeah. well, hopefully the stretch code won't go away. And I will actually see if I can dig into the DOER and see if they can do it where the stretch code lasts, where, 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 where it is right now. Yeah, the BBRS minutes from the last meeting. Or, right. Darren, do you know anything about that? We actually, I wasn't at the last meeting, but it, I mean, in conversation with Ian and at DOER, I mean, it basically seems <coughs> that the stretch code is stalled and it's basically for political reasons at this point in time. There has been some conversations, as what you alluded to just before, the performance path, that having a lower ERI score, you know, that might be the the, uh, the stretch code provision. So there'd be a, sort of a, a tiered approach to the home energy rating score. Uh, the other theory that I heard was possibly using the International Green Construction Code as the stretch code. So obviously that would only apply towards commercial buildings, uh, but could probably be adopted, you know, somehow to residential or maybe using the ICC 700 for residential. Um, so it's still up in the air. It seems to be you know, caught into, in some political gap. As this gentleman was saying, you know, if you go to BBRS meetings this, these days, there's, it starts off with about two to three hours of, of fire chiefs from around the state testifying, and you know, there's definitely more interest in the sprinkler issue than there is in uh, the code the energy provisions of the code, so we're all kind of waiting to see. The only the other piece of legislation, if I could, that's kind of interesting is uh, is CPACE. There's a CPACE legislation. Oh, yes. And, okay. Uh, yeah. That, that might be beneficial for North County. Yeah. yeah. Take a look. Yeah. It's, um, yep, I've actually kind of identified which ones yeah. are, there's a couple of them. Yeah. yeah. Two of them, I think, at the moment that are focused on that. Um, does the C stand for commercial? It does, yeah. right. Commercial piece, right. Exactly. Right. But I, I will speak to them tonight, and I'll get myself more prepared for that. Um, all right. Uh, actually, um, speaking of stretch codes and stuff, I just wanted to, I probably haven't mentioned this. Um, uh, both Wayne and I are members of New England Municipal Sustainability Network. I think I got that right. Uh, anyhow, uh, it's New England, it, it's municipal uh, employed folks working on sustainability throughout New England, uh, throughout New England, um, uh, and it also includes Albany and New York. Uh, they, we get together every, twice, twice a year, once in December, once in June, and the decision has been made, <laughs> put it that way, <laughs> I raised my hand a little bit at one point, and it was like everybody else stepped back. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> The decision was made that we're going to have our next meeting in June in Northampton. Uh, and me and um, Stephanie Cicerillo are helping to kind of organize that, fundraise it. And, one, and the topic we want to focus on um, are energy efficiency and microgrids. Um, uh, and Mary's actually going to have a tour of her house uh, as part of this, uh, as a um, a, a, for what it's worth. Right. No, it's okay. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, we're, we, you know, when we're talking to uh, folks in other states, um, well, when, I, when we were on a planning call with them, um, when I brought up energy efficiency, you know, a couple of people from our state said, well, you know, how's this, you know, this got to do with building codes. And I said, no, this goes beyond building codes. No, no, this is building codes. Said, no, this is beyond building codes. You're trying to get beyond building codes. So the difference between Massachusetts 
and other states is enormous. So your house is going to blow people away, um, uh, possibly. And um, uh, and uh, I, I'm actually going to try to get some local speakers. Uh, Louis, I haven't asked you yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be getting back to you. <laughs> um, because uh, to kind of help them, help them out, help share some of the knowledge to other states. Uh, but I think it's kind of a, a nice piece, North Tampa, just to, to uh, showcase what's happening here on the internet. So, yeah. I just want to mention that. And that's June when, again? June uh, 8th and 9th. Yeah, we haven't got everything to set yet. But. Chris, can, do you mind if I speak once again? Uh, sure. Just uh, a heads up, if you, if the council or the city is looking into the incentives based around the energy code, I'd be uh, happy to volunteer to help with that. I did a lot of that work in New Jersey. Uh, we had all kinds of incentives and accelerated filming density bonuses, uh, as well as I helped the uh, city of New York with their uh, executive order 34, which was a, a green zoning that allowed uh, buildings uh, to get closer to lot lines, uh, height. Uh, zo zoning variances, if you were going to do solar or wind, uh, if there was restrictions for canopies over the sidewalk, they were waived uh, for solar canopies, things of that sort, so I'm more than happy to, to help with, with that. And what, I, I don't think I need the commission's permission, yeah. why don't we yeah. talk? Sure. <laughs> and the other thing on the... On I'm very the, interested. Yeah, I'd love micro, to talk with you about it. On the microgrids, I've been uh, talking with, with Carter, actually, from Transformations. I've been trying to convince him to consider the possibility of making that development a, uh, a, um, a uh, utility district and to mm -hmm. speak with, you know, because you're talking 83 homes there, mm -hmm. uh, all zero energy, so I think that, that would be a really excellent opportunity for a utility district. And he seems a little hesitant just because the, the timing that it would take to probably pull that together, but it might be something that the council could urge him to, uh, to consider. Let's let's talk offline sure. on both those. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. And weren't you going to apply to be on the committee, on the commission? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. I don't. I haven't seen an opening, but right. as okay. soon as one's available, or I'm happy to be associate. Have you put your application in? No, no. Is that the you, next you step? Be the first you can okay. serve as an alternate. Yeah, as an alternate. Right. So. Sure. Yeah. yeah, fill out your application so you can sit okay. up here with these uncomfortable desks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I might see a pad. <laughs> you want to see a pad and see if that's real. These state of the art desks are pretty impressive. <laughs> Two drawers. <laughs> <laughs> Two drawers. <laughs> Two drawers with graffiti in them. Right. Dating back to the 40s. So. Um, Okay, just a status report. Uh, there's not a lot farther to go on the community energy efficiency outreach planning, but let me. Again, I did. Been working on the, with the working group and others. Uh, I keep forgetting how updated I brought everybody up to speed on this. So, this is um, from the working group that met last week, the week before. Last week. Last week, right? Last week, right? Um, um, let me give you an idea. We really now have an idea of where we're aiming for. And so, let me try to give this as an overview. Um, uh, hopefully, I can be clear on this. The idea is, instead of looking to do a massive marketing outreach to the whole community, the idea is to identify um, uh, the most prominent building types, and I think you guys have heard this before already, so the most prominent building types throughout the community. Um, identify um, what features would, you know, what would be the, most, the best energy conservation measures that could be installed in, in them with some idea on how much um, energy could be saved by that and partner with local builders, installers in order to do audits and, and actually kind of tighten up that model. So they're going to be able to build a model for a building type that's really based on distance information uh, and then tighten that up with audits and stuff. And, at this, and the last time we were talking, alongside of that would have been some kind of a marketing um, research uh, uh, and plan happening on the side. The change now is that instead of doing that off the side, that would become subservient to the building types, which may mean that we actually identify a building type or two building types that we, I, I say, that's our highest priority, and then focus marketing efforts on the folks who live in that building type. So again, it's kind of narrowing our fo focus more 
but in a way that, if we're successful, allows us to um, kind of adjust this going forward, expand it to other building types going forward, and slowly grow this as we learn. Um, so, and that was really, uh, actually, Bill was there. Um, Aiden wasn't there, but he got it filled in with some uh, some paperwork I sent out. Uh, if you guys want to add anything to that, am I missing anything? Oh, Louis was there too. Oh, Louis was there. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. One one thing that that I came across is that uh, there's some um, CDBG money um, that that might that, that may be able to be directed to um, you know home working on. The homes of low income, single owner occupied single family homes for um, low income or elderly people. And so I think that what, what I mean, what occurred to me is that there's liable to be other monies that we could tag into this. So when the outreach person shows up, if they can gather a little bit of demographics, they may be able to say, oh, and you could get your roof replaced, or you could get, you know, and I mean, or you could contact these people, it sounds like you may be eligible, and they have funding available for X, Y, and Z, however we characterized it. But that's, I mean, that's certainly an opportunity. Um, and if we could pull a few more together, um, 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 what's the name of the um, people I'm thinking of? Hilltown CDC is coming down, I think, to Franklin County. I don't know how, I mean, to Hampshire County. I don't know how far they're going to come. And uh, Community Action has their whole inter, uh, insulating Valley CDC. program. Uh, I don't know what Valley CDC does. But, well, their developers put also consultants and first time that home buyer uh, consultants. And but so if we could, if we could create, uh, I mean, a, more of a network for our outreach person. That's good idea. Um, you know, yeah. that when they sh when they show up with like a, a cup of coffee, that's one thing. If they show up with a whole smorgasbord, I mean, they're going to be, um, you know, perhaps get a better reception. Right. Okay. That's adding some Is um when we were talking last week about narrowing down the building type. You were, you were there as well. Yep. Okay. I it was on the side. <laughs> but, um, What's going on? <laughs> Walter, but Scott. <laughs> but um, so so this is for the consultant to to then give us an idea. So we're we're taking this to somebody who's then going to do right. this outreach. Uh, this is going. This is our idea. This is going to end up with um, kind of a plan on doing outreach. Okay. They're not. We're not asking any of the consultants to actually do the outreach. Okay. We're trying to set the groundwork so that when we do the outreach, we know how to do it right. And, and yeah. when we do that outreach, we're asking people what they want, right? Probably, yeah. Okay. I would assume so. Because I, I was just at a, um, I was in a group over the weekend talking about Cape Wind and why it died. And the reason was it was totally top down. You know, yeah. they didn't go to the communities to get any buy-in. Right. And what a shame. You know, so just making sure that we're going to each person and saying, what exactly do you want? Right, right. No, that's the whole concept yeah. here. Yeah. Instead, of, instead of saying, that's the neighborhood that needs it, uh, we're going to go and sell it to that neighborhood. Yeah. What's it? Yeah. You know, yeah. we're going to really try to identify the community okay. and what's going to work for them, right? Yeah. What so, moves them? So the grant, the first uh, group hired will be identifying the building typologies. Yes. Right. That's their main goal. Right, right. And then Doing we'll. Some kind of remote modeling based on data available. Right, yeah. And so I'm feeling like that's a, this is a model that's clear enough in my mind that I feel I can start putting together procurements um, and trying to find them. I mean, it's finally, it's taken a while to kind of gel this, but I think it's been a really important and good conversation. So, any other questions on this? Which one we got? There. Um, Last item is a status update on ongoing projects and grants, and like I did last time, instead of bringing something to you guys, just don't give an opportunity, because anybody have any questions on my list of different things we have going? Oh, okay. 
one on the LED project. The article I read in the paper didn't make it sound like it was going to be a performance contract. It said that a loan was being taken out, so are we not going that route? No, the, um, the paper actually, there was a small error in the article. It, the, the article also said that we were going to, uh, you know, now the city council's um, allocated money, we're going to go out and procure a um, contract. We already have. So it is a performance contract. It is based on a 25 day. And um, the grant. Using the, the state model contract with yeah. Siemens? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, it, right, Siemens contract um, based on the state's model with our terms and conditions tossed in. And um, Siemens, who, who's been selected contractor, um, just got back to me that our terms and conditions have been gone through their legal team and they're ready to sign. And so the, um, the investment grade audit. Uh, contract should happen soon, very soon, you know, maybe by next week. Um, and then I hear that they would probably be starting the audit in the end of April. Uh, okay, any other questions on that? I'm willing to let us all out early. Make <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks>, speech. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>